Washington. Uh, we farm, we aren't used to presenting, so please bear with the shaky voices and, and clammy um, palms in case this mic falls out of my hands. <laughs> so you have um, in your folder a pretty detailed introduction about our operation. So we thought what we would do in this presentation is basically just take you through a whole year of what it is like on our farm to actually raise our organic peaches. Um, we started with this shop though that is actually taken in August because peaches set their butts towards late summer. So really, um, it's more than a year in the process of a peach because it actually has started the summer before. It's all the new growth that you see right through here, right there. That's, that's your peach. You just got to wait for it. <laughs> so then, you got to advance this. OK, we'll figure this one out. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. That is. So this is basically winter in Bridgeport. Um, looks a little bit like what your winters are here as well. The river that's flowing in front of our farm is the Columbia River. And our farm is actually, we have 26 acres on our farm, but our water permit is for six. And so that was a limiting factor, or what we felt was a limiting factor when we first started our farm. But as we have farmed now, we have realized that maybe it wasn't as much a limiting factor as just kind of guideposts for the type of farming that we do. Um, six acres is all that we have to grow our fruit on. And so what that means for us is it's not about quantity, it's about quality. You'll also see that alpaca down there, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, how we partner up with alpacas on our farm. Okay, let me um, Right now, uh, it's, it's uh, our pruning season, um, and so here we call this late winter and early spring. Um, and with our pruning, this is, this is what we try to get done, um, and it takes us about six weeks to go through the orchard. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, this is, um, our trees were actually uh, put in, we bought the orchard uh, in 1991, so we have something in common. And so um, that is, that's our peach tree was actually planted in 1988. Try to do. Uh, where's that look? Um, on this, you can see where we have a lot of growth, right in the middle and down low. You can see where there's down low. And so, what we try to do is open like a V to get an open center. We take out the lower branches, and if there's any disease or broken wood, we'll take them out, and we'll actually burn that wood <laughs> as we pick them up. Um, the process takes, um, that tree probably took us a half hour to do. So we have 350 trees, peach trees. So it's, a, it's quite a process. Um, the reason we do all this is for weed, pests, and diseases. It's more like, just like a conventional larger. But we are, we concentrate on it to make sure that we get, every tree counts, every limb, every cat. It's a, it's a, it's part that we, love, we really enjoy. It's, a, it's winter, and it's early spring, so we'd love to get out there. Okay. Part of our weed control operation is actually um, using a tiller and cutter board and hand trimming under the trees. So it's important that those lower branches are taken out so that we have the access 
to um, get to do that weed control. This is one of our sons. We have four kids. Um, well, they're not kids anymore. Um, we have four children. And they have all grown up working on our farm. Um, we have what some call a vertical integrated farm, which means we do everything from the growing to the harvesting to the picking, the packing, taking to market and actually at the farmer's market selling them. And so those, all of those uh, tasks take different kinds of talents and abilities and interests. So it was good because um, our four children are all very different as are Rick and I and all of you. And so they, um, there was something though that each one of them could find that they enjoyed doing, felt comfortable doing, and made them be part of the farm. So um, any of you out there who are and have a family farm, or thinking about that maybe in the future. Um, there are definite benefits to it, um, but there are a lot of challenges as well in working with your children or your spouse. <laughs> so early spring, um, the first thing you see up here is monitoring, and this is a mantra for us. Monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. You know, as organic farmers, there are many more tools that you all have now than what we had 20 plus years ago. But the biggest tool that you have is you being involved in your farm. You being out there and you being staying on top of what's happening out there. There's not a lot of cleanup sprays in organics. You know, what we have are effective, but the timing is critical. And so it's especially important that um, you're not just on your tractor or on your truck driving through your orchard. Got a bud called footsteps um, because you just need to be out there as far as an organic farmer. Um, so what we uh, we do right now, um, they're dormant, which the buds are really tiny, and so we prune that out. Then the next stage is <clears throat> they start to swell. And so at that point, you're looking at, um, I guess it would be the green aphid, um, because they start to emerge just as the green tip. We call it green tip, it's actually the first leaf. And so at that time, um, we, well actually at the, I should back up a little bit, uh, we, right after we prune, we put a dormant spray on, which is and it's for Korean life in peace. It seems like they all have it. So if, you, if that's the spray that we use to control it. What is it? The Korean blight. Or Korean blight, yes, it's a um, it's a protective, I guess, solution that comes out of your peach. And so what you need to do is is you spray copper on it and it actually um, that backs it down a little bit. So you don't have to As the, as the, as the, um, uh, I guess it's green tip it is, you want to, timing is crucial on this, um, because green tip is the first emergence of your leaves. You have to get out there and spray lime sulfur and oil on, but if you wait an extra couple days and there's a red tip on it, you can actually burn your first set of leaves. So timing is really critical, really critical on it. And that's where your footsteps come in. Um, where are we at now? We are to spring. Yes. Yeah. That's the guy, that's the guy, that's the guy. We, we all love bees and beneficials. So this year, I mean, in spring, uh, we're out there monitoring. We're looking for pests and diseases. We get to apply our fertilizer. And it's time about crop protection too. Okay. Yeah, this is um, what we're going to do right now. Uh, we have a 10 scope, and we're going out and looking at the blossoms. Uh, at this time, um, you, you can actually find uh, your 
are pests inside the blossom. Um, and so we go out and uh, take a look at many, many blossoms. And uh, where there's actually a green fruit worm that climbs up in your tree, um, there's a, uh, your peach twig worm is prevalent right then. And uh, if you didn't meet your green aphid uh, with your lime sulfur spray, there'll be green aphids actually too. Um, and how we do it, there's other ways to do it. We use um, traps to monitor our peat trig moth. Uh, we put up sticky tape, and of course we have beating trays to find out how many good bugs we have and bad bugs. Also, what we're looking at at this time is if there has been any frost damage. So, and then that helps us as we move through our marketing and we have a good idea of how much or how little crop that we will have to be dealing with as time goes on. So, the aphid, the twig board, the green fruit worms, this is, these are our major pests. You may um, be challenged with other ones here. And we've written down a few of the name brands that we have used, and we're not, we are not endorsing these. We're just, this is what we use. This has worked for us. And so that's why we have put it down. Um, we found with the powdery mildew, it's really weather dependent. If you have a real wet season, you are going to have to deal with it um, very vigorously. And it's helpful if you rotate whatever sprays you use. So that's why we listed a few of these. Um, beneficial insects, we release ladybugs um, on our farm. We release green lacewings. They complement your program. Um, there were years that philosophically we said, oh, <laughs> let's just try to work with the beneficial insects. And that can be really difficult because in our area, it's not warm enough for those guys to come out when we're needing to battle in the early stages of some of these the pests. So we found, though, um, what has been most successful for us is if we are early on that dormant oil spray on those aphids, then our aphid population, once it comes to April and May, can be controlled by the ladybugs. Um, they are, like I say, complementary. And for us, anyway, we weren't able to um, do without also partnering that up with some sprays. So, gosh, learned so much just this morning. Um, That's the key. Yeah. Um, it was good to hear the results of that study. I think we will probably reassess really how much nitrogen we need at this point now to use on our orchard because we do mulch with bark. Um, so we'll be checking that out. So thank you. Um, so there was a, um, a problem in some of the organic compost that was coming out of WSC, Washington State University, maybe 10, 10 11 years ago. Um, it was contaminated with glopyrolid, which they traced that back to the, fee, the, the fields that the grain that the chickens ate that then they pooped out and was part of the compost. And that was really scary for us because WSU put out bags and bags of certified organic compost. So we decided that we needed to close that loop. We needed to bring uh, nitrogen. We needed to produce it on our farm. We needed to stop having to outsource that because uh, we lost confidence in what was out there. So we looked around at all the different animals um, that we could bring onto the farm. And bringing livestock onto your farm is a whole other layer of challenges and benefits. Um, so we looked all around at what we could bring in. And when we got to the part about camelids having communal 
gun piles. It was, oh yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. So they literally do. Um, alpacas, llamas, their cousins line up and go, um, all go in the same place. So collecting it, <laughs> much easier. And that's what you see, those little, those little black beans are actually um, part of uh, where the communal gun pile is. Um, alpacas are an extremely environmentally friendly animal. Um, they need fresh water every day, but only about a gallon, gallon and a half per animal. Um, they just eat low-protein orchard grass hay, which is fairly available in our area. So we have 22. And that's how much we have found it takes to fertilize six acres. And as you can see, um, organic is labor intensive. I want to point that out. It's not only being out there, you got to work. So we, um, these are uh, our bags that we used to get, and so we try to recycle and use. Of that coming in snow. 
So we have very, we have some spring, spring rain, but our summers are very dry and um, we are in triple digits for um, a few weeks each summer. And then we also start thinning. So this is, um, we find these all the time out there right now. This, that is not a very good picture, I'm sorry. Uh, but it is a casing of a crane mantis. And so I brought this into the house and figured, hey, we might as well take a look at it and see if it actually does what it says it. So one day we were sitting around in the kitchen and Marilyn said, oh, there's, there's a hand in here. And pretty soon she looked down and she says, oh, no, it's a crane mantis. And so out of this casing, there was 50 of them roaming our kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, later on in the, um, we always looking, uh, right here are little white eggs of green, green lace wings. And so we have developed a really nice, with our spray, of course we don't kill them, so they produce really, really well. Also I'd like to point out too, with our beneficial insects, uh, around our orchard we have places that we don't mow and we put in beneficial plants. So it's very, very important if you want to keep your beneficials around all year to have beneficial plants where you don't, you water it and so you can grow pests and beneficials because the beneficials have to eat something. So, you know, you, it's a heck of an adventure out there if you go out there and you know it's a war and you hope that you're a good guy to beat that's my philosophy. Um, right now, the, uh, the peach tree borer uh, is probably the biggest pest um, that, it, it, that we deal with. Um, and so at Blossom, you spray a BT, um, and that's a bacteria. And it will kill the worm, the overwintering worms. Um, so after that, we put, we put up traps, and we monitor for a threshold. So we go with three to four moths in our traps. The first one, we don't start our degree by day model. We wait until we have a good threshold. And then we start a degree day model. And that just takes information every day, highs and lows. It accumulates out to how many hours it takes for when they mate to produce the offspring. So that will, by doing that, you will know when to apply your next spray. So that's very, very important. Um, and also, you're out there, you're looking for any mildew. And it's a, once you see mildew, you know what mildew looks like. So you, you're you always out there. I just said I want to impress upon that. Um, so those are the, the in the early spring, uh, those are the things that, and if you did well, in your sprays early, you will not have your uh, green aphids. And if anybody has seen green aphids work, boy, they are, they are crude. They, they know how to do it. So those are the things you want to monitor and keep aggressive on. Uh, so those are, the, and the, those are the things you see on the powder builder. Those are still the things we try to, try to use. We don't use it every time. We plan to alternate them so they have um, a different, uh, different bacteria strain. Um, this is a great picture. I really like this picture. Um, you can see this is a, we have micro sprinklers and they're mulch. And that's the second year mulch right there. Um, and we trim underneath the trees and leave the or orchard alleys. Uh, so we kind of alternate that too. We'll go and um, we have hand trimmers and we'll mow underneath the, or trim underneath the trees, and then we'll leave the orchard alleys. And then once uh, we want to mow the orchard alleys, we'll mow one side of the alley. So we always try to keep something there for the beneficials and the pests. They want to be somewhere. So we want them to be down in the ground, in the open. So we, we really, really try to keep something there for them. Um, with the micro sprinklers, uh, they're 90% efficient. So once you put it on there, uh, you know that you 
then we do a 12 hour set and it's just convenient for us. Um, we will, uh, it just depends on the year, uh, we'll air feed just the alleys and underneath the trees just to keep our grass going so our beneficials have something to drink because they, they get thirsty too. We don't want them to leave so we will we'll actually um, irrigate for maybe an hour on all the sets just to keep it enough to, to let our beneficials have something to eat and drink. Um, let's see. And we're, we're, actually, we're actually thinning right there too. Um, and it's all about hand thinning. And I think we have another picture of that. There are chemical, organic chemical sprays that you can use for thin. If we had 60 acres instead of six, we might consider them. Um, with six acres, it's, it's doable to hand thin. Um, like I said, you know, we're, we're about quality and not quantity. So we do hand thin. Um, there's a couple different ways that you can make that decision on thinning. You can actually count the leaves or a couple times until you kind of get the idea of what 30 to 35 leaves looks like. Um, or you can try to space them six to eight inches apart. It's important that um, your, the fruit that you leave is pointing down, which generally means that they're going to have a nice um, coverage of leaves over them, which will help protect them from hail, which I didn't well, we need to add hail, I guess, is precipitation, but we don't really like to see it that way. Um, but it does keep them from hail. It, it kind of protects them from birds, um, and they're not getting sunburned as, as well. So we try to keep them pointing down. And you need to recheck. As, in, as much as you think you did that job just right the first time, I don't think any of us ever have. Um, the fruit is small, it's green, the leaves are green, it's tough. It's, it's tough to get it all at once. So um, we try to do that tree, step back a bit, take a deep breath, look up there again, and inevitably we will find more that we need to go back and do. But here's your end result. So these peaches were thin, six to eight inches apart, and you can see how they nicely they have filled that space in between. Hopefully most of them are pointing down. So on to summer. So this list has grown since winter. Um, we're really in high gear now. For the majority of the time, um, Rick and I can take care of the jobs that are necessary in that six acres. Um, our sons will come in and help us do some pruning and, and when we're thinning, because you want to get that thinning done um, as quickly as you can, um, we have a couple of other folks that come in and help us. When we get to summer, you can see this list um, needs more than just what two people can do. And there's our friends right there. They're, uh, we pick them ripe, and they know that those right those guys are. Um, the peach tree born out, um, we have not been monitoring. And we know that um, we can actually spray um, sometime in July, because it's usually, in our area, that's usually when we uh, find out when we can. We will spray it, it's all about the weather. Uh, we can spray 7 to 14 days up until harvest. Um, and we try to do it because that's our major pest during harvest. Um, we also have um, birds. I don't know if you guys have birds here, but we do have birds. And they like beaches. Uh, you know, what the heck, I would too. And so we try to do a lot of different things. Um, these are the things that work for us. Um, the Mylar tape, seen that before. It's silver and red and it's shiny and it makes them fidgety and so they don't like it. Uh, we have a owl decoy. 
that we put out, and they all ran on it, and, you know, but we move it around, and they, they think it's, it's, I don't know what they think, but, <laughs> but the one that really I like is, uh, is the way it's all blue, and it, 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 it twirls, and it has a lot of, a lot of speckly things on it, and it seems to help us out. So, um, you'll see, too, that the one more process is that we do like to pick our fruit, fruit right, and um, we never, you can see right here, uh, a padded bucket and a start of a row, and we'll never put that piece of fruit on top of another piece of fruit without a pad. So we just pick all the fruit into a bucket, single layer. Sure. Yeah, I think we have a picture coming up, and that was a point um, I wanted to make too, is um, birds are not stupid. And if you put that bottle of tape up too soon, they figure that out. And so they're used to it by the time that fruit is ripe. So you need to put that tape um, up like a week before what you would anticipate you, you are going to be picking. So you can see in this next picture those kind of um, pieces of the tape, the shiny strips that you see hanging down. There could be six to eight to 12, just kind of depending on the size of the tree. Um, so we control, we trim under the trees at this point, mostly for um, our benefit. We have rattlesnakes where we live, um, and it's real nice to be able to see where you're walking around your trees. So that's more for our pickers. Um, we are mowing the orchard floor as well. Irrigation still the 10 to the 14 day intervals as necessary. And propping, you can see um, those wooden props. There's one in that, um, that first tree there. And branches get really heavy with that fruit. And so it's really important to help support your branches or it's, there's no sadder sight than walking out there in the morning and find that you have a four foot branch that is now broken and all that fruit is hanging and falling on the ground. So we try not to see that very often. Um, the little bit of pruning that we will do in the summer is mostly just to keep whatever water sprouts or have grown up kind of in the center of the tree. Again, you know it's so important for disease control to have that good airflow and then also for your spray coverage and then it, it lets the sun in. Harvest, yay, fun. So as Rick was saying, we do, um, we pick our fruit ready to eat because that's how we market it and that's what our customers want. Um, it took us a long time to figure out how to do that. There were many markets. We showed up with bruised fruit. We showed up with fruit when the customer would pick it up and it would be fuzzy on the top. So fortunately for a lot of you guys, there's so much more resources and tools now. Um, you don't need to learn by trial and error the way that we did. Um, we do burst our fruit, make sure that the sugar content is up before we pick it. Generally, people think 13 is a peach. Uh, we like to start about 14. So when you color pick, um, that means that you're not going to your tree and you're not picking the whole thing at one time. You're only picking the right fruit. And that is a, that's a real tricky thing to teach people. Um, and the only way you really understand it is to pick it and take a bite. And eventually you figure out which ones are right. Of course, you can't take a bite out of every one of them, so we hope it's a, a fast learning curve. Um, so we may go around each one of those trees four to five times. We'll start, and basically we're following the sun. Oh gosh, we better break, so we're on 10 minutes, we're on questions. Um, so you can spend a lot of time doing that, like Rick said. We do use um, buckets, single layer, as you see down here, with the three of them. Um, we don't stack our fruit. There's many, many buckets. Um, we have 500 buckets, and oftentimes in the course of the morning, we have water load up, they're sorted out, we're reusing those buckets. Um, the little white golf cart looking thing actually is a car. Um, 
um, and that's how we bring our fruit up to the shop from the orchard. We don't leave the, um, those buckets on the ground any longer than we have to. Um, we found insects will get into them. Um, they can, they're in the sun, we don't want that. So we try to get them up and into the packing shop as quickly as possible. Pieces, they all have to come down. 
So don't tie those knots too tight. Um, we're picking up props, we're bagging the mirror. Um, hopefully we're about to our final set. That's water dependent and make sure you drain your lines so they don't freeze. And then we're still working on fall disease control. And a lot of what you do in fall is really going to make a huge difference in the next spring. And then processing. So this is our fruit roll-ups um, in 2008. We had oh, we'll see, yeah. anyway, we had a um, pretty significant windstorm that blew two-thirds of our nectarines on the ground. So what to do? What to do? We went out there and we picked up what we could. We washed them and froze them. We were already freezing apricots and peaches at the time. So over the winter, then we were able to thaw that fruit, blend it with a little bit of organic honey and organic lemon juice, put it in our dehydrators, roll them up, and it became a new product for us. Um, and another thing about marketing is the importance of a brand. So you, well, you can see our Wama Farm label here. Everybody has a story. And when you're at a farmer's market, you know, we're not the only organic peach grower at the farmer's market, but we're the only one who has our story. And so it's really, really important that you develop the way to communicate your story to your customers. Because they are not only buying that piece of fruit, they are buying what stands behind that piece of fruit. So we do all of our processing, and then the Saturday before Thanksgiving, we head back to Seattle. It's a huge market, as you can imagine. People are ready for Thanksgiving. They're getting, buying some of their holiday gifts. Um, that's our one shot. We pretty much with most of everything that we have processed. We also have our CSA sign-up order form ready for the next year. Um, because we are such a small operation, there have been times when people have not gotten what they wanted. And so each year, we actually have been offering that list early in the year because um, our CSA members get the fruit first. So these are the resources that um, we have used over the years that um, have really helped us a lot. Um, you as well here have many too in this room to help you out. So, so that's about it for our story. Um, oh, and we bought enough of these. We'll put these in the back if you'd like to try some of the dry, the dry peach. So questions? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, we do. We um, Rick went through the WSU sharing program, so he we now can share on farm. It's a huge um, financial savings there. We sell fiber directly. We send our fiber to be spun. We sell the yarn. We also have it woven into rugs. And at some point, we might we bring on farm. We might we might sell. Just to add on to that. Um, with that added value and the manure, we still have to buy them grass hay. So it's kind of an equal thing. We have to, uh, the money that we get out of all that, in turn, will pay for their food. Yes. It is um, divided as dramatic. dramatic. It's out of dramatic. It's a cold pressed fish fertilizer. The In the fish emulsion? Yeah. D-R-A-M-M. -M. That's their website. If you look up Graham, you'll find it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you see the yeah. CSAs or do you just have your own CSAs? There are a couple of CSAs that buy our fruit and then they put our fruit in the, their CSA boxes, yeah. Is there a question here? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, actually the only tools I think we have found is water will work. Um, you know, we, the way that our irrigation is set up, we can't irrigate our whole orchard at the same time. So we choose those areas that are most you know, most vulnerable to frost and they will burn water. We live on a hill, so the frost runs off. But down at the bottom, that's where we put our water. I'm curious how you package and sell your fruit. You've got a four pack, and what do you do with the size of it? Oh, 
Sure. So, um, the, so we have the single layer pan packs, and so those are, you know, those come in different sizes. What is that um, It's a thirty dollar box for a single layer, and there's a, there's a, the average about twenty pages. About seven and a half pounds. No more eight pounds.